Hello and welcome back to Local Writers Read. Um, we are here for our September event with the theme of success and victory. Um, for those who follow the series, this is also the final event of our 2021 series. Um, so thank you for everyone who's tuned in and uh, everyone who's been along and kind of this up and down journey as we've navigated formats and just the strange times that we live in. Um, we're very thankful to everyone who has joined us to read over the course of the past two years now. Um, and also everyone who has tuned in, chimed in, left comments and just engaged with what we're doing here. Um, I think we've talked a lot about how the arts and community have really just played such an important role in all of our lives um, during these kind of strange times. So it's been very meaningful to me and Claire and all of us to, to have these opportunities. Uh, that being said, I am Josh Gothier. For anyone who is new to the series, I am here with my co-organizer, Claire Guyton, and our guests for today, who we will introduce very shortly. Um, Claire and I started Local Writers Read a number of years ago now, really just to showcase main writers from different genres and forms, um, to bring people together from over the state and just have writing community together. Uh, in non-pandemic times, our series is, um, is hosted by Quiet City Books in Lewiston, um, and Courtney there um, is the owner and has been um, a champion of the series from the beginning. And she was actually able to read with us yesterday, so if you missed that, check out that video as well. Um, and also a shout out to the Lewiston Public Library for supporting the series as well all this time. Um, yeah, we are very happy. We have three more fantastic writers with us today to help close out our season. Um, and as we said, the theme is success and victory. Um, we give um, every event, we give our writers a theme to kind of think about and use as a starting point when they select their pieces and then invite them to take that in whatever way they feel like. And so success and victory lends itself to a certain type of story or, or poem. But as we saw last night, and as we'll see today, there's still lots of room to dive into those words. Um, but hopefully as we near the end of um, another year and another season, it seemed like a good note to go out on as we um, dive into today's um, poems and stories. So I will turn things over to Claire to introduce our readers today and then we'll get going. Thank you, Josh. Welcome back everyone. Thank you for joining us for part two of our final regular 2021 event. Josh, two years, <laughs> you just said it, two years. Did we think we would have two years on Zoom? And did I ever think I would say the sentence, I am grateful for Zoom? Because at least we were able to do it. We were able to get people together. Um, it's just, it's been a ride. Um, I hope we do, can do this in person next year, um, but it's just wonderful to have you all here. Um, and to have uh, our three readers tonight who are great friends of the series. Once again, we'll be talking about success and victory and I'm really looking forward to hearing you all share your work. So we will start off with Nancy L. Brown. Nancy lives and writes in Western Maine. Primarily a mystery writer, she also writes about the joys of slowly growing old. Nancy's work has appeared in the anthology, Summer Stories, Work Literary Magazine, Stone Coast Review and the Bethel Citizen. She's a Pushcart nominee, recipient of two Green River Writers Awards and a finalist for the Maine Literary Award in Fiction. Nancy has been with us from the very beginning. It's great to have you back, Nancy. After Nancy, we'll hear from Jefferson Navicki. Jefferson is the author of Antique Densities, Modern Parables and Other Experiments in Short Prose, 2021 as well as the poetic novel, The Book of Transparencies, 2018, and the story collection, The Paper Coast, also 2018, because he is that hard at work. He is the archivist for the Maine Women Writers Collection and lives in Freeport with his wife, dog, cats, and chickens. Great to have you back, Jefferson. I think you've read for us every season as well. Gibson Faye LeBlanc will close us out. Gibson is the author of two poetry collections, the prize-winning Death of Ventrilo Ventriloquist and Deke Dangle Dive, published in 2021 by Caven Carey Press. Gibson's poems have appeared in The New Republic, Tin House, Jubilat, Poetry Northwest, and Orion. 
and his prose in Canyon Review Online, Portland Magazine, and Slice. He's executive director of the Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance, helping all of us being writers and lives in Portland. Again, thank you all so much for coming, sharing your work on success and victory. Settle in everybody. And then here we go. Nancy, whenever you're ready. Well, I wanna thank Claire and Josh and also Quiet City Books and the Lewiston Public Library uh, for hosting this event. It's been great over the last few years. This, this afternoon, I want to read a story that is called Kathy Deshane. And it's pretty obvious what the story is about, but it's based in Bethel, Maine. And I happen to be in Bethel today at the Bethel Library, which has gladly said that we can use their facilities. And I've been spending the day at Harvest Fest. You may hear some noise outside and it's still going on. Uh, because the library is raising money at the event. So having said that, if there's any loud noises like chainsaws or music, we'll bear with it. Okay, Kathy Deshane. On a snowy April morning, Kathy Deshane pulled on her hunting boots, grabbed her rifle from behind the kitchen door, and picked her way down the steep bank toward the edge of the pond. The path was well-traveled, but six inches of new snow made it slippery. One misstep and she could break her leg or a hip. Not good for a 70-year-old woman, even one in great condition. The rifle served a dual purpose. It gave her balance as she headed for the chicken house, and she might need it to kill the fox that was prowling around her chickens. Something had created a racket just before dawn, and she'd fired a warning shot toward the pond. Bonnie and Stevie, her two old black labs, made their way to the edge of the pond and were sniffing and scratching at the fresh snow. One of them stopped to dig at the brilliant yellow daffodils that stuck out of the snow. Stupid flowers, thought Kathy. They should know it snows well into April and May. But still, every year, the daffodils and crocuses popped up before the last snow. Bonnie and Stevie paced between the dock and boathouse, barking and pawing. Their front paws danced up and down on the ice where the melting pond met the earth. Don't you dare, Kathy said. You know the ice won't hold you. The TV meteorologists had reported that this was Maine's third warmest winter on record. The skiing was crap, snowshoeing was non-existent, and ice fishing ended early when the ice became shaky. Kathy squinted her eyes, trying to see past the glare of the sun on the snow. Cracks and fissures crisscrossed the snowy ice. A hundred yards from shore, Kathy's ice shack tilted precariously. She had missed the April 1st deadline to haul it in. In late March, a sheriff's deputy stopped beside the road. He took off his face mask and shouted out a reminder. Don't forget to get that shack in off the ice. Since Liz had died, no one reminded her of these simple things. And since the quarantine and the edgy panic over the coronavirus, almost no one offered her help. She would have paid good money for some help with things that Liz used to do, but most people were staying inside, keeping their distance. Maybe it's a good thing, she thought. It's time to keep our distance. The world is warning us. This is our chance to reboot and to start over. Kathy wasn't really worried the fishing shack would sink. After all, it was attached to pontoons from her father's old seaplane. After the plane lost its engine and crash landed into Songo Pond, her father's buddy, Jack Lurvie, winched the crushed cabin out of the lake, dragged it ashore and sold it for scrap. He salvaged the pontoons and bolted them to the fishing shack. The pontoons made it easy to pull the shack across the ice. And if the ice melted first, like it appeared to be doing this year, the pontoons would keep the shack afloat. When the ice melted, she'd fire up the outboard and haul in the ice shack. Easy peasy, that's what Liz would say. God, she missed Liz so much. Kathy peered toward the sun rising through the pines on the far shore, backed up to her shack, was what looked like a truck with no tires. Kathy shaded her eyes against the sun for a better view. It was a truck, all right. Truck bed was sitting on the ice. Someone had stolen the truck's tires or they had sunk into the pond. Hey, you and the truck, are you okay? What are you doing out there? Kathy's words echoed across the pond. No one answered. The truck was not unfamiliar. She was certain it belonged to Jack Lurvy. Kathy pulled her phone out of her pocket scrolled down her contact list, and his name was still there, 
among all the other numbers she didn't have reason to call anymore. She hit his number. There was no answer. I'll get your attention, Kathy said. She pointed the rifle at the sky and pulled the trigger. Bonnie and Stevie whimpered and cowered on their stomachs. I'm sorry, girls, Kathy said. She bent and rubbed their ears. Still no response from the truck. Kathy moved cautiously onto the dock that jutted out from the boathouse, watching for icy spots and rotting boards. The dock got her 20 feet closer to the truck, but still no sound, no movement. Where are you, Jack? What the hell is your truck doing in the middle of my pond? Get your sorry butt over here and get that truck off the ice before it sinks. Below Jack's number in her contact list was Liz. Without thinking, Kathy punched her number and the call went straight to voicemail as it had always done for the past six months. This is Liz. I'm out feeding the chickens or kayaking on the pond. I'm living the dream. Please leave a message. But she could not leave a message. The automated voice told her the mailbox is full and cannot accept any new messages at this time. Kathy wanted to scream. We're not living the goddamn dream. We're a failure. They bought the land 30 years ago to farm and to live off the grid, as they used to say. At first, everything failed. Foxes killed the chickens, the bears tore out the blueberry bushes, and the ground was too rocky for vegetables. It was the pond, the fish, and some goats that inched them towards success. They sold lake trout, smelts, and bass. Finally, Lizzie got a job at the Dollar Tree, and when the minimum wage went up to $10, then $11 an hour, they did okay. Lizzie only worked 20 hours a week, but they were selling fish, eggs, goat's milk, and cheese. It seemed that people loved to eat fish, but nobody wanted to do the work of catching them. They cornered the goat milk market long before raising goats was popular. In those days, nobody else was making goat cheese within 50 miles of Bethel. But since the coronavirus hit, people stayed home. No one wanted fish, and the market for eggs had dried up. Kathy had always sold a lot of eggs and milk and cheese to skiers, but the ski resorts trust closed in March. Most days, only one or two cars drove by, except for Jack Lurvey. He drove by several times a day. He's spying on me, Kathy told her friend, Nat Bailey. Bailey was a local private investigator who worked part-time at the Dollar Tree when the detecting business was slow. Nat became friends with Liz and Kathy. Now with Liz gone, Nat stopped by at least once a week, bringing provisions, raking the roof and shoveling snow, tending the greenhouse and helping with the cheese making. She was on call to help birth the kids, which would be any day now. If the town had not been sheltering in place, they would be gossiping about the two women. Nat Bailey tried to reassure Kathy that Jack Lurvey wasn't a threat to her. It was an accident, Nat said. Jack Lurvey's car had skidded on black ice, crossed the center line, and hit Lizzie's fragile little Prius head on. Lizzie and Jack's wife, Caroline, were killed. Lurvey's blood, hall, blood alcohol level was a fraction below the legal limit. There was nothing anyone could legally do, the officials said. One day last week, Jack Lurvey stopped his car in her driveway, honked his horn, and got out. Kathy DeShane, get yourself out here. I just want to know that you're okay and see if you need anything. She opened the door and stepped onto the porch. Get off my property, Jack. I don't need anything from you. Haven't you done enough? She slammed the door. The dog stood at the kitchen window whining. The dogs liked Jack. These are tough times for everyone, Jack shouted. I'm sorry about the accident. I truly am. I wanted to know if you need some help selling your eggs and cheese. You can sell them online, you know. I'm out here on the road every day and I could deliver stuff for you. Jack stood in the driveway for five minutes, then took a paper sack out of the back of his truck and set it in the driveway. For the dogs, he yelled at the porch. It's not poison or anything, let them have it. The bag contained large beef bones. Kathy gave them to the dogs. She didn't think that Jack Lurvey would hurt an animal. After the driveway incident, Kathy called Matt Bailey. I'm going to sue his ass, Kathy said. I'm coming over, Nat replied. We're supposed to be distancing ourselves, Kathy said. I'll wear a damned mask. Despite her friend's warning not to pursue the case, 
Kathy called one of those big name lawyers who advertised on TV. He needs to pay for what he did. I want him to suffer, she said. From what you say, this man has suffered. He lost his wife too, the lawyer said, and he declined to help. He's trying to make amends. In his own way, he's trying to make this right. He can't make this right, Kathy said. Now Jack was here on her property again, somewhere out there on the ice. Was he waiting for her? What did he want? She was tired of being alone, with no cars stopping at the farm stand, with no family here left with her. If her world ended, no one would ever know. Kathy stood a moment on the wharf, then picked her way back around the water's edge to where the dogs had resumed their game at the edge of the ice. They were scratching and barking at the snow again. Hush, she said, and leaned down to pet the dogs. Jack Lurby's face stared up at her from under the snow. His eyes were closed and his long gray hair floated around his head. His prized Red Sox cap was missing, but it was definitely Jack. Kathy was shaken. She was probably in shock. She backed off the ice and collected the eggs from the chicken house. She called Bonnie and Stevie and they went back to the house for breakfast. The scrambled eggs with goat cheese didn't sit well in her stomach. Her victory over Jack Lurvie tasted bad, real bad. Oh my God, Jack, what were you doing there? Did I shoot you when I was shooting at the foxes this morning? Her hand shook. She poured herself a glass of cold river vodka with a splash of orange juice, just enough to give the drink a little color. She took out her phone and made the call. 911, what's your emergency? There's a dead man in my pond. Kathy sat on the porch with her drink. She propped the rifle against the porch railing. The dogs were safe in the house. She heard the screaming sirens and saw the flashes of white and red and blue as the emergency vehicle thundered down Route 26 toward her house. In a few moments, she put down her empty glass and joined the first responders at the edge of the pond. Thank you. Our next reader is Jefferson. Thank you, Nancy. Phew, that was just an affecting story. Um, I wanted to keep going on. Poor guy. Um, thank you, thank you, um, thank you, Claire and Josh, for for putting together this reading series, one of my favorite ones, and for coming up with this um, theme, success and victory. It feels like as poets, uh, we're usually uh, in the ground, in the area of um, depression, sadness, failure, loss, you know, that's where the poets usually hang out. So you give us this theme of success and victory. I was like, now this is going to be interesting to, to see what kind of work that I can um, come up with that speaks to this theme. So uh, I'm going to read a few prose pieces uh, and then a few poems. Uh, and the prose pieces I'm going to read from this book, Antique Densities, that just came out um, a couple days ago, actually. Uh, and uh, just a couple of them. I'm, I'm going to have a, a virtual book launch at Print uh, in Portland on October 1st at 7 p.m. with the incomparable Kate Marvin, a poet who I really admire and a friend. And we're going to talk about the book and I'll read a few things. So I'll read a few of these from Antique Densities. And uh, I think the most relevant thing is that um, this, this book has taken me 16 years to publish and 16 years to work on. Uh, and while not all of the pieces are that old, um, some of them are a few years old, some of them are like 15, 16 years old. And in fact, all three of the ones that I'm going to read are uh, 15 years old. So it's like this time capsule I'm going back and pulling these things out of. And I, I'm not sure what that says about me 15 years ago, like success and victory was maybe like I felt like it was in grasp, um, but now maybe it's not as much, but no, I don't, I don't really know what that means. But um, these are just the, the pieces from 15 years ago. So uh, this first one is called A Theme for a Tapestry. It's about how history is, um, is uh, represented after a major fact. And um, the, the, the end of the first line is this nod to uh, one of my favorite prose poems of all times, Carolyn Forche's The Colonel. Uh, which probably some of you know, it's a pretty famous poem, but it's so good. Uh, and it's, 
It's about this poet who visits a general who's a dictator in a South American country. So a theme for a tapestry. The general is generally not an angry man, not the type of man to cut off ears and collect them for future dinner parties. And yet something will have to inspire him to inspire his troops. Rumors have the general's men at 81 and the enemies at 1,200. A massacre sometimes sounds like an extremely dark country night full of ripple and stir. On the night before the battle, the general wakes from a dream he cannot remember, suddenly as if emerging from water. The sensation left him is of a tunnel through which he hears occasional gun music, but cannot sense any light. It feels like his soul has been pickpocketed for a prolonged moment, not without a certain uncomfortable pleasure. Years later, when the craftsmen and weavers work on the depiction of the historical event, the tapestry will bear an uncanny resemblance to the dark tunnel of the general's dream, as if the maker had been present in the general's mind for his stunning tactical vanguard. They will decide it is too large an event in the history of the world to be contained within one tableau, and they will decide to divide up the final work. But should it be a triptych? Should it be more? Uh, and then the, this next piece is called Red, uh, and it's, it's um, a, a piece about kind of a, a bad night out on the town um, and sort of influenced by um, your older sister. It's a story somebody told me a long time ago, so um, the trouble that her older sister got her into. So it's called Red. In the movie, they drink a specific type of hard liquor infused with herbs. This is famous liquor made by monks and drunk by, famous, by a famous French actress, my sister tells me. I drink a little and am drunk. I am out on the town. I don't do this very often. It's my sister who pressured me into doing this. At first is just the two of us drinking this specific drink, talking about how I never go out. You should go out more often, my sister says. But I don't want to, I say. Ha ha, you don't even know what you want. Then we meet up with more of her friends. We go out even longer and farther. I have more of that specific drink. My sister, who knows how to convince people that she knows what she's talking about, says, look at my little sister. Everyone looks. She is really living, my sister shouts to the bar full of her friends. I smile drunkenly and awkwardly like an adolescent experiencing her first moment of adult pleasure. Then I throw up in the bathroom. I wanna go home. There, this is no longer enjoyable. In the bathroom with the stall door locked, I have the distinct longing for my mother. I want her to come into the stall and hold my head as it perches heavily on my neck over the toilet bowl. My sister knocks on the stall door. Are you all right? She is not my mother. I'm going home. I tell her and begin walking. I'm convinced my apartment is only 10 minutes from the bar. However, now I am crawling, now that I'm crawling on my knees, my pace is extremely slow. The streets are wide and lift upwards at the ends, curved like a bowl or the banks of a powerful river. It is difficult to crawl in the slanting landscape. My knees hurt. Why am I crawling? This is torture. I get up to walk. Walking is the only way to get home. When I am walking, I can never get far enough away from where it is I have left. I arrive home at my apartment. My boyfriend is writing at his desk, working on a review for a magazine. He says, I've been laboring over one sentence for almost two hours. You are moving in slow motion. Yes. It is because I have been out with my sister. Oh, he says, did you have a good time? I go into the kitchen because I want food. My stomach feels like it will soon curdle. I need bread to soak its contents. In the cupboard, when I reach for a plate, I see a cockroach the size of a shoe, and I want to burn it alive. A huge bonfire, and I'm throwing cockroaches on the flames with a shovel. I dig into the pile of cockroaches, hear them click together like knives and forks, then throw the load onto the fire. The cockroaches burn like newsprint, crackle. This moment makes me famous. I write joyous in red crayon across the kitchen cabinets. My boyfriend comes into the kitchen, stands behind me and wraps his arm around my waist. 
He nuzzles his chin into my neck and mumbles, that's it. That's the word I've been searching for. And then this last piece, um, I am, I was trying to think of how, I have no idea, like, because it's uh, so, these are so old, I can't really remember like how the piece came into my head, but I do remember where I was when I wrote it. Uh, and it, it was this kind of uh, like a private residency with me and this friend. And he was living in Colorado and he had access to this, um, I guess I would just call it like a new age mansion somewhere in the mountains above um, Denver. And he invited me there and this was huge, huge house. For, and we're just like two young guys trying to work on our novels and like not very successfully in this weird, weird house that was like full of, it was very white. I remember it was all white and it had a lot of like hunting paraphernalia. So this is where this poem came out. It's called Chronic Tailbone Theory. I have this tr chronic tailbone theory, chronic in the sense that it surfaces often in my thoughts. I believe the old deer tailbone I've got in the back of my garage can fly if given the proper encouragement. In some of the old folklore, the tailbone swoops in and out of the fire circle as if gliding on air currents. When I try this myself, it never works. I drop my tailbone from my second story window and it falls into the snow 20 feet below and I can't find it until thaw. The problem with my tailbone theory is a leak in its spiritual aura. I can't say the right spell that will seal off the spiritual leakage. I've tried various incantations, but the tailbone still gives off ghost gas like a leaky pipe. I talked to an old mountain healer named Manly Slipper who said it's all about the magnetics. The, the what? What you need is a dab of pus, he said. That will get all the spiritual flows going in the right direction. Pus is some powerful shit, Manny Slipper said. And you know you done right because the tailbone will turn a jaundiced hue. I must have done right because now that tailbone flies like a fucking bald eagle. Pure bone white beauty with a jaundiced hue. All thanks to that pus. I love pus. I'm going to have to get me some more, some more of that in case something goes wrong. Okay, so then we'll speed up 15 years to some poems. Um, and um, so I grew up in southeastern Ohio, and uh, for a long time, I didn't write any poems about Ohio. And then recently, in the past year or so, I started writing a lot more poems about Ohio, which, uh, which was pleasurable, a little surprising. And then at some point, I kept writing more and more poems, and it, I kind of got self-conscious about it. I was like, this is, I'm not going to write another Ohio poem. And it started to feel like every poem I was writing should have started with back in Ohio, and then I would write something about Ohio. And, uh, and I started to feel like I needed to cut that from every poem. Uh, and it started to make me think about kind of how when you're, when you're just a person, how you edit so much of your life out of um, what people experience. And certainly as writers, we have to edit so many things out of, uh, out of our work. So it's part of kind of a living and editing poem, you know, all those Ohio poems. Back in Ohio, sometimes I cut the phrase as I would a hangnail or clip it like a video for which I pressed record too early or slash it like a suspect clause in a sentence already labeled awk. Sometimes I go in like Dr. Serap, slip my skin to slip out my appendix, that useless nub that only sits poised to rupture and cause so much trouble for such a small clump of syllables. Sometimes I slice, slice off like the bad bit of a strawberry butt thrown to the chickens for a snack, as if to say, here, have the source where everything grew, but now I can't use. Or I use it like, or I lose it like the unlucky appendage I don't think I'll need. If you had to choose one, make your best guess. Sometimes like my head lopped off by geography's guillotine. Should I be surprised when my neck can't grow another head like it said it could? In another poem, it did. Editing as a function of everything becomes ingrained. My tongue, a white out pen. Aren't we all masters at the art of our own excision, surgeons to our old selves? What I don't say is I've saved every one of those casts off cast-offs in a tiny music box behind the squeeze box of a lung. 
I'm looping them all together to make a pop song so catchy, soaring in such sublime sugar that it'll make you cry every time. Um, so I was really excited to hear, we were talking about this before we, we went live, some of Gibson's sports poems, uh, which I think are so, it's so important to have good sports poems, especially as someone who is a, is a sports fan and, and I played a lot of basketball when I was growing up. Uh, so I was kind of excited to go back and look for a sports poem. Uh, this is a basketball poem uh, and uh, I was a college basketball player. And I was an all state uh, high school basketball player, which kind of tells you like to the point that I got to, but it doesn't tell you like how far in it got into your body. And that's something I appreciate about Gibson's poems. Like it speaks to that, especially as young, young boys growing up in the Midwest, like it certainly it gets in there very deeply. Uh, and, and basketball was, um, was um, conflicted for me, I guess. I, although I loved, I loved the game, I had a lot of trouble with the culture, sports culture, and I also had a lot of trouble like performing in front of people, like the pressure. I loved playing with my brother and my dad, but in front of thousands of people, and that didn't go as well always. So this is a poem about that. It's called Practice Player. You're the best practice player we've ever had, the assistant coach pulled me aside to say. A flush of pride before I realized what he meant. Great in practice, I choke in the game. I once kept a notebook with all the plays, all coaches' sayings and what they really meant. A carryover from my rote academic success. If I memorize everything, I won't get anything wrong. It worked for the periodic table. Why not instinct? I would study reflex, measure glint. If I want to be good, won't I be good? What happens between the translation of want to reality, especially when the body is willing, skilled, and ready to take up the fight to practice for the entire life of legs? Another coach, one I loved like a second father, gave me a book on the winner's edge. How to train your brain for success in sports. Of course, I read it cover to cover, took notes, tried to inhale it. I learned the killer instinct was unlearnable. Winners eat winning for breakfast. To win is to fly. Winners keep that certain flint of barbaric grace. One win is worth two deaths. Winning sets the doves free. A winner's eye contains rare air and blue sky. Winners never cheat, or they always cheat, but they always win. Winning is brain food. Winning is God's favorite food. Winning is the music that plays at good weddings. To practice winning is to win your dreams. Winners are giants. Winners are passionate Roman-nosed hotties. To win is to give yourself a red-blooded rose. Winning is a skin. Winning is Mount Rushmore. Winning is colonizing. Willing, winning is racist. Winning is the white man's burden. Winning is caveman. There's no pit a winner can't rise from. Winning is a mask. Winning is a domino for more winning. Winning is a Band-Aid. Winning is the always green grass, cool air off the water. Winners wear dark sunglasses. Winners roll over losers, stick an L on their foreheads, keep on rolling as the faces of the losers become dirt, become the ground we stand on. And then this is last last poem. Um, and um, it's based off this poem that I read, I really admired um, by a poet um, who I probably shouldn't say, but it was, a, it was a great poem. But the first line was started, uh, but I think it started, I killed my two worst vices or something like that. And the poem, I loved the poem, but that first line kind of stuck in my head and it like, didn't, I, somehow I didn't like that first line. So I was trying to like kind of play off that first line in a different in a different way. And then the other thing going on is in this poem is that um, I love psychics. I love psychic readings. I love astrology, tarot, like I can't get enough of that stuff. Uh, so um, there's something about a psychic. And sometimes I do everything psychics tell me, which I probably shouldn't do. And I, but I was thinking about like, what would happen if a psychic told me to do something that I really don't want to do? So a little bit about this poem. It's called Controversial Advice. 
I took my two most familiar vices and shimmed a vowel to make them voices, then slipped a slant rhyme to make them verses, twirling them on the tongue, all because I didn't want to do away with them the way my psychic said. A chipmunk below the bird feeder fills its cheeks to the breaking point. You can't help but look greedy when your face is that full. Blur birds flit without judgment. Fed up, my psychic sent ghosts to graveyard my vices. Once them out like tenants months overdue with rent. But I'm still in here futzing with puns and ignoring all the ruckus at the front door. All that knocking and I'm like, what? That's not the secret knock. My vices, like cats around my ankles when I pop the top of the wet food can, only appear when they're hungry and it's time for their food, which is honestly the grossest stuff, slices of some not quite meat carved off the ham hock of my insecurities and covered in a chunky gravy. The smell makes me almost vomit, but they love it as evidence from the nips at my ankles when I'm a little late. I can't help myself. It's not that I want to reward bad behavior or hoard my faults or willfully ignore my psychic who otherwise does indeed know what best to do. I just can't get behind capital punishment against any part of myself. Regret is depressing company, but I never completely trust anyone who banishes it. Wistfulness is another story. Wistfulness lets me, lets me float back on the perfumed past. A, a what if swirl that goes straight to my head, fine and a little too sweet, like breathing cake air too long, such an aging canister of ignoble gas. The past is puncturable, my psychic emails in all caps. I delete unread. Such a thin vice, more like wisps or a sip of something not all bad, but all you need is one match. Ask any forest. Still, sometimes a good burn is exactly what I need. Thanks. Um, Gibson is, is going to read to us next. Thanks so much, Jefferson. Uh, great to hear those poems. I love that basketball poem and the, the strangeness in those earlier poems that you read. Um, and, uh, and also, Nancy, I'm going to be thinking about Kathy. <laughs> I'm still thinking about Kathy, wondering what's going to happen to her. Um, so, so you you, you had you had me uh, gripped there, um, and I want to thank Josh and Claire for putting this together. I love the series. Um, um, thanks for having me. So I'll read um, six or seven poems um, from my book Deep Dangle Dive, which just came out this spring, um, and um, <clears throat> as the title suggests, it is it is uh, the it's not Phil it's not all hockey poems, but. Um, but the hockey poems are certainly sort of a, a central thread in the book and, and uh, kind of the spine of the book in some ways. Um, and uh, I started writing these poems. I, well, I wrote the first one. I'm gonna read the first one that I, that I ever wrote. It's the second poem in the book. Um, and I sort of thought, oh, that was nice. I wrote that one hockey poem that I'll probably ever write. And then I, and then I you know, over those next few years, I started to realize that that writing about hockey was a way to write about other things that that maybe I wasn't finding ways to write about. Um, it was a way to write about my brother. It was a way to write about childhood. It was a way to write about tenderness. It was a way to write about violence. It was a way to write about parenthood. Um, so so all this different thing, all these different things kind of wove their way in, and hopefully you'll hear some of that in the poems. <clears throat> so here's that first poem which takes place in a hockey locker room. And, and, and so thus there is a, an F-bomb or two um, that get thrown. So um, my apologies for those, but I'm just trying to be true to the, to the locker room itself. <laughs> hockey poem. The goalie, six season fit, his graying mustache leaping as he spoke, said, no fucking talk about books here, to two defensemen breaking down a novel. The room, we were cinching shoulder pads, grabbing helmets, roared. If you haven't been in this locker room, here follows the list of subjects allowed, sex lives with detail, deer or moose hunting, bar rooms, and hockey, kids, adult, professional, pond, women's, 
we're 21st century hockey players, I said. And then I read this wonderful poem the other day. We roared again. I wasn't kidding, but wanted the roar. Dear committees, keep your fucking medals for reading poems or writing them. Someday I'll deke that goalie, cat-like at 6 a.m. on a Thursday, swiveling, kicking out puck after puck. I'll crush a body, sprint the boards and swing in front of him. Show him the forehand twitch and switch and slip puck into net. Then I'll deliver lines on a man who finds and kisses his brother. And the goalie's heart will leap and flutter in the way he thought could never happen outside this brutal, beautiful game. So um, this, this book uh, is also dedicated to my brother who died last summer um, after a long battle with cancer. And uh, that's obviously here in these poems as well. And um, again, hockey was a way that I found over those years as he was kind of riding this roller coaster of, of uh, illness to, uh, to get at some of that stuff. So this, this poem is an effort at that. Um, it's um, called Luck and it's in four parts. One, tonight my stick finds puck after puck. Some wobbling, some slapped at, some fast and low and caught in stride, even two plucked from air, gifts. Four in all feel Annette's rope arms are made true. No one in the stands to shout to Lucky Julius, which is what my brother used to call me after I drew an ace or threw in a three off the backboard or dribbled a grounder into prickers the cheapest home run ever. Today, they shoot lasers into his brain and my shot pings the post, three, and goes in, of course. I know the goal does not matter. Our guts push out over girdles and after we talk chiropractors and knees. That Julius from the Prince, a Pope, moved armies without thought or care, which is one way to be lucky. Four, but how not to keep score? Two kids, a wife, he just turned 42. We puff, wince, and swear on the bench. We try not to wonder when thunder will surge through limbs, our long, and our long sticks will forget hands, pucks, speed. So um, yeah, this, this, well, I think this poem is pretty self-explanatory, except maybe I'll say it's about men's league, which, you know, is one of their many, many uh, adult hockey leagues, especially in the Portland and Lewiston area, probably all over Maine. Um, and I've played in some, um, and I've, I've read, I've mostly retired from, from, <laughs> from those. I, I play a, maybe a, a slightly less crazed um, morning version of, uh, of hockey these days. So men's league. Last night's score sheet, snapped stick, missing helmet screw, a pinky I'll never straighten. On the bench this morning, I lectured two kids on the best way to get back at the boy who slashes and trips. Take the puck and score a goal, I said, like it's the easiest thing. Last night, I did the easiest thing. Hit back, cursed the ref, lowered my head and rammed ribs and shoulders. The pinky aches, a mark to remember how badly we want this game to last. Pass the buzzer and final tally. So this, um, this poem, this next poem is called The Last Game. Um, it references my brother's last game when he was, he was a high school hockey player for a while and then stopped and, and this, the poem kind of explains that. Um, and uh, I don't think there's anything else I need to say. It's all in the poem. 
the last game, the night my brother's hockey career ended, he dangled two and dazzled across the ice, furious scripts the other team couldn't read. When someone's will, maybe a coach's was done. A nod, two words, number nine. This was 80s high school hockey. Better tape your fingers, hockey. Call the cops when the stands empty, hockey. So one kid knelt behind my brother and another cross-checked him over that knee. Whoever said the games we play don't have real stakes. Lee crumpled headfirst into the boards and lay there until a stretcher carried him. The doctor said a few millimeters in either direction would have snapped his neck. And now these doctors measure his game time in months, not years, not decades. My brother plays with cranial staples, infusions, endless forms, and learns the penalties, the rules, and odds of loss. After that game, he left the team. I followed and stuck to empty Sundays, blasting Springsteen and slap shots on an unguarded net. This game we'd spent our childhood on, lines and circles, was gone. Our mom and dad about to split, our rooms filled with blue lines we never crossed. So I'm going to read two more of these. Um, and uh, I should say for the non-hockey folks out there, um, this, this, th it's in the title of the book and, and it's in this, this poem. Um, the, a deke is just, if you haven't word, heard the word deke, it just is another word for a fake, right? It's a, a word particular to hockey. It comes from the word for decoy. Um, it's like, I'm going to, show you the puck and then I'm going to take it away and I'm going to make you think I'm going this way and I'm going to go that way. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is called Deked Again. Sometimes you dangle the puck, pull it back, and a tank shoulder giant with a hooked stick pins his eyes like a boutonniere on a prom lapel and plants his gloves in your sternum. After the doctor scans, poisons, and scans, and one of many tumors in your brain doesn't shrink like the others or grows stubborn as a crocus in snow, he cuts open your frontal lobe. I write your eulogy in my head, see myself in front of a crowd, see the obituary's flat font in the paper, put my left hand on your youngest arm. I count you gone. I'm not proud. And you, more than a lesson I learned about breathing next to a droplet on a leaf, more than a decoy for me, are my blood most like unlike me. And still you teach as you once taught. Try to get past me. That each morning a defenseman stands with his stick waiting to see how you will try to entice him. Force, will, quickness, simple pleas, back into his cage a six year long game and counting. The defenseman waits whether we see him or not. And each day now I watch how you keep your head on a swivel, wait for the pass, then find an extra gear. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm um, giving you all a tour of most of the hockey poems in this book. Um, and this is one of the last ones, um, which is about being a hockey dad <laughs> and coach at times, although I've now retired from that as well. I just get to watch. Um, so hockey dad, this was from when my kids were, were, were a little younger. Once you have ice blocks for feet, icicle fingers and a lump in your throat to tremble your body with cold tomorrow, you doubt the sanity of waking at five. The eight-year-old on ice by six, blades carving shapes you can't name. And when your boy looks through his coach's face on the bench with red cheeks, a fire in each wooded eye and complains about tripping that number 16 with the black mask says, I'll chop him down next time. You doubt this game. 
at the hour you venture into the warm room to thaw out your spine and hear a father break down his son's backhand highlight spinner in a voice loud enough for all to hear, you know the annual backyard ice sheet was a bad idea. But also remember all those hours with your friends and brother. Legs pushed until muscles wailed, then sang, knocked down, scrambling up again, skating the last tenths off the clock, down, up, bearing each sore ounce, each breath and every sinew, humbling yourself to the rules of a game and the flawed eyes of a referee. And then ask, is this such bad training for what is to come? Thanks everybody, it's great to be here. Wow. Um, so right now I'm just uh, feeling uh, gratitude because you just all sort of brought it home for us so beautifully. It's been a great season and I don't see how we could have ended it better than having the three of you read for us this afternoon. It's just, just wonderful. Thank you so much. <sighs> um, so I'll, I'll get us started on our chat while, uh, while Josh checks on Facebook. Um, Nancy, I'm going to give you that compliment that I know you're sick of my saying, but I say it every time I hear you read, cause I can't help it. I just love the way that you write about Maine. I just feel like nobody does it quite like you do. I just always, uh, it's just so authentic. It's so you, it's so Maine. And I love that about your work. Um, what I wanted to ask you about was situating this story within the pandemic, which I have, I personally have had a hard time writing through the pandemic. Um, and I know right now that I, you know, maybe soon, but I, I don't know that, I don't think I can write right now about the pandemic. I can't situate anything in the pandemic right now. Um, and your piece is, I think the first main story I've read um, in this set in this time. So I'm, I'm wondering, and you did, by the way, I felt captured not only Maine as you always do and, and you know, and held our attention as you always do, of course, um, and made us worry about your character um, and what she may or may not have done. Um, but you also captured the atmosphere of the pandemic, you know, the, that character is so isolated and just kind of on her own and she doesn't know what she's done and what effect it has. It just, it felt like the pandemic, you know, that you really did that so well. And so I just, I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit about what that was like for you to write something situated in this, um, in the current time. And if, are you writing other stories situated in the pandemic? I've written uh, several stories uh, situated in the pandemic and they all have a common thread. I guess we might call them linked stories. Um, similar characters. Um, I wanted to write because I wanted to capture for myself uh, mainly what it was like during the early days of the pandemic and not lose what, because things changed so rapidly um, last year and they're still changing rapidly, but I wanted to catch some of the early, because this was set um, in April of last year. I wanted to be able to remember what it was like during those days when people were feeling really isolated, when people felt that there was no one that was going to help them, when people had to sit in their house for months at a time. And so the stories that I've written focus on people who are people that I don't think are written about enough, uh, like a woman who has lost her wife um, on older people. I have a story about a woman who, uh, an, a 90, something year old woman who drives her car to sell it back to the car dealer because she knows that she has nowhere to go during the pandemic. And on the way she stops to see her brother who's dying. But, you know, I wanted to capture some of, of in, in all my writing, I want to, I write about people who aren't often written about. So people in the LGBTQ community or older people, um, workers, people who are working at the Dollar Tree. So, you know, um, and I think we're gonna see more writing about the pandemic, but I think it's really hard to write about something when we're in the middle of it, unless we're journalists, of course, you know? So it's, um, I mean, I know that there are workers who, just one last thing, there are workers who 
work in retail, people who work in libraries, people who work in public spaces, who went through a lot um, in the early days of the pandemic. They, there were fights, there were people who refused to put on masks. And I wanna to try to capture some of that in my um, future writing about the pandemic, but I just couldn't do it yet. So I think it's important though. Well, you've, you've done a wonderful job to get that started. So thank you oh. for that. Well, thank you. Um, Jefferson, I warned you. I warned you. I want you to talk about that that last poem. Can you read the first bit of it for us again? You did tell us a little bit, and you shocked me actually when you talked about um, astrology. I never would have expected that. I've I've known a couple of people who are really super into astrology and get psychic readings, and they they have a way about them that is very, very different than the way you have about you. So I, I never would have guessed that. So if you only want to talk about that, that's fine too. That's really interesting. So, but, but give us a little of that poem again. I, I love it so much. And um, just tell us whatever you want to about it. Yeah, sure. I'll just read the first stanza. I took my two most familiar vices and shimmed a vow to make them voices, then slipped a slant rhyme to make them verses twirling them on the tongue, all because I didn't want to do away with them the way my psychic said. Um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm glad that I, well, I'm a, I mean, I don't know. It's, that's funny to hear that about, uh, about psychic reading, but I, I almost like I have to stop doing them. There's just something about, I could just kind of do them for all the time. And then I, sometimes I find out too much information and then uh, sometimes my wife is like, why did you ask about that? And like, I don't know why I did. I just had to. Um, but I, the, the psychic I was kind of like thinking about was um, I, I, had, I did tons of readings with her and she did all of her readings over email. She was in Seattle. She was just like very, she was just the real deal. And like she told me two, two months or two years, two years before uh, I met my wife, like the month that I would meet her and she was right, um, which I had forgotten about, of course, but I won't look back at. So um, that's a kind of a strange, I mean, there's a strange power dynamic a little bit in those kind of, those relationships. Like there's a way in like psychics feel, I, I sometimes feel like my brain is just this open book and they can just figure out what I need to do, which is kind of a dangerous, dangerous scenario. Uh, but that's what I was, in the poem, I was trying to like feel out, like what happens if this person who I trust so much in some respect tells me to do something that I don't, don't want to do. Jefferson, so, I just want to, oh, I was just Sorry, just real quick. So do you, you currently have, a, a, you, you've stuck with this particular psychic? You still get readings from this particular psychic? No. Sadly, she retired. She oh. went on, she went was traveling the world to Borneo and Vietnam, and I don't know what she's doing, but um, no, not anymore. I was, I, I'm, I'm always looking for other ones. I, I just wanted to jump in and say, uh, Jefferson, I love that sentence that begins that poem, what you did with mm. that, the way you complicated that, the, whatever that the original source was, mm. and you added that music and, and um, those turns to it, and uh, and then also, um, I, you know, I, I can understand from a psychological, emotional level, though you might say like, yeah, maybe too much psychic, but from a like poetry level, I say go all in on the side, <laughs> just do, you know, I mean, James Merrill had his Ouija board, you, you know, you could just, you know, <laughs> there's probably whole, whole books of poems that uh, could come out of, out of stuff from the, yeah. that, that come out of those experiences, so. <laughs> Yeah, I see that. I'm so I'm I'm going to have to have another conversation with you about this. I come from I come from completely the opposite, which is partly why this is so um, fascinating to me. But when I write, I write about a lot of this stuff. I find it endlessly fascinating and such a great way to just think about everything that happens in life. And it's so I mean, it's just so much source, so much inspiration. Um, I'm with I'm with Gibson all in. Do Even though mean, I'm, I'm coming at it from a completely different place, but all in on the writing. Do you mean that you write about like psychics or psychic ability and that kind of thing? All kinds of stuff. I, I have written about psychics. I have written about um, fortune telling. I've written about, I, any kind of paranormal kind of thing. I've, I've written about it probably. 
because I find it endlessly fascinating. It's just feeds so many stories, despite the fact that I, like I said, I think about it very differently from you. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm always. I sometimes I try to like um, if my something is going on with my wife, and I'll say, "You should ask the psychic about this." She's like, "No way." <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> I <respect> wow. <laughs> Wow, I never would have guessed. I, like I said, we are going to have more conversations about yeah. this for sure. <laughs> um, okay, if no one else is gonna jump in, I'm gonna hit Gibson. All right, Gibson. Okay, I am so excited about these sports poems. I'm actually a huge sports fan myself. I can watch probably any sport and really get into it, but my favorite one is tennis. Um, and I think about it all the time. Like I, I love it both because I feel like, I feel like it, you know, it, it reflects the human condition and it also distorts the human condition. Like it puts you in this fantasy place um, and it kind of puts everything in this sort of black and white, you know, like, oh, and I loved your riff on winners too, Jefferson and your piece. Um, that also made me think of tennis. Um, so anyway, the hockey, I, uh, it's just, it's very exciting. My husband's a huge hockey fan. We've watched a lot of hockey together. Um, the basketball was great too, the, the piece Jefferson. So I, I just love this whole thing about pieces about sports, but what I really want to hear from you after having hearing your, your beautiful poetry on hockey, I want you Gibson, the talented accomplished poet to talk about hockey as poetry. Tell us all how hockey is the stuff of poetry. Yeah. You know, I, I, I didn't realize this at all when I first started writing these hockey poems. Like I, I like I said earlier, I, I I wrote the first one and I thought, oh, that was like kind of a fun trick that I just did there, and that's never going to happen again. Um, but in writing a bunch more, in 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 frankly, I've been asked this, I've been asked different versions of questions around this issue. You know, like why, what is it about hockey? Or, um, and uh, you know, I realized kind of looking back. I think that there's something about the the um, the physicality of hockey that I that also parallels the physicality of writers that I really admire. Right, um, the writing that I most admire is often it doesn't have to be describing physical action, but it has like a physicality to it, you know, to the very language of it. Um, and I do like you know I like action and I like speed and I like you know some of the things that. So, so um, uh, you know, I kept, I've kept writing about hockey because it's a way to get that stuff um, into my writing, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, and you know, obviously, um, certainly the like, it's also like this, um, this because of our childhood, it's this deep connection to my brother too, right? So that's part of it for me too. But I'm I'm interested in. Um, in, I mean, I love all sports and play a bunch of them. And in fact, I play tennis a lot too. Uh, a friend of mine just handed me a copy of um, the, um, uh, what is the name of it? Uh, Abraham Bergese uh, wrote a book called The Tennis Partner, I believe it's called, or The Tennis, yeah. Um, it's about his relationship with this 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 guy that he was in residency with um and they played tennis together and that's about as much as i know but it looks fantastic but I, i'm i'm i am interested i mean i think sports provide a window into so much in our lives and and also their physicality you know and the way that the way that we um uh you know the can can just react in the moment um and the, our bodies sometimes do things that we don't expect either for you know that we want them to do or we don't want them to do i think um uh so i've i've, I've also like i was also um uh i've also liked that moment jefferson when you were referencing winning and all that stuff because i've certainly I've done my fair share of choking in, 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 in uh, important sports moments. And I think there's something really interesting there too. in like that, you know, sort of like, as soon as you like think in while you're playing a game, you're done, you know, like it is, it is all about not thinking, right. You know, but as writers, we can maybe bring, bring the thinking and the physicality together um, on the page um, in an interesting way. So 
I don't know if that answers your question, but that's a whole lot of, 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 of thoughts about it. Oh, no, that's great. Go ahead, Jefferson. Oh, Gibson, I just was wondering, about you because you, you've written all of these, I mean, they're, they're very affecting hockey poems in this book. And I'm kind of wondering if you're still write, writing hockey poems now, or are you kind of like, are they moving a little bit or like, like what's going on now? Yeah, I have not, I, I haven't written any hockey poems recently. Um, I could see it happening, you know, I mean, it's, it's something that I do a lot. So, you know, I think that, you know, the, the, you know, lots of parts of my daily life, you know, work their way into poems, you know, doing the dishes or, you know, um, walking around the neighborhood, uh, you know, all those things work our, their way into our writing. And, you know, I still do play hockey regularly and, and we still will, you know, uh, climate change, uh, if climate change allows, well, we still do our, you know, we do an ice rink in our backyard and my kids and I get out there and play still, my boys. So anyway, so yeah, I suspect there will be more of, of, the, of, those, of those hockey poems um, and, uh, and maybe some other things too, maybe other, you know, other ways to, now that I've sort of like had the chance to, think about it um, and, and sort of reflect on my process. I, I probably will be looking like, oh, I wonder if there are other sports things or other just ways of being physical that I can look to as entrances for poems um, or other writing. Cause I think that that is a, a sort of, it, it, it helps me, I think, get into a piece of writing to have that. I hope you will write a lot more. I mean, you've got me, you've sort of lit me on fire now. You got me thinking about all this, this physicality stuff. I, I'm a horrible, horrible athlete. Um, but in college I did judo. Mm. Um, and it was the first thing that I'd ever done. And I just completely fell in love with it. Um, but I wouldn't compete. I had the opportunity to compete and I wouldn't compete. I would only do the judo. I would like I'd go to the practices and I, you know, I'd do all the fighting and everything, but I never at a competition because I just couldn't bring myself to compete. Um, but I was so grateful for the fact that when you, when you really get into it like that with somebody, like those physical boundaries go away. I imagine they happen in basketball and in hockey too. Like you get into that personal space in a way that you don't do otherwise, and you lose your sort of fear of it. Um, you can't be intimidated in the same way after you've done that once you really can't. Mm -hmm. And now I'm thinking about, you know, how we think of our, our heads is so separate from our body. Like we write our, our poetry or our stories with our heads, and, but of course it's all the same. And I'm thinking about judo now, like as the, or, or hockey, like the body is the instrument. And when we're writing, the body is the instrument as well. So, and, but I hadn't really thought about it quite that way. So now you've got me all excited about that. And I would, I would love to read more poems. And I will say that I did finally figure out how to compete. And it was around the same time I really got my writing going finally, when I was at, um, when we first moved here and my, my husband works at Bates College and they had a, a badminton team and we started playing badminton or not a team, but um, faculty and staff. And so we started playing with them and I'm talking about real badminton, not picnic badminton. <laughs> and it was so fun. And suddenly I found myself screaming curses <laughs> and like, and just smashing that birdie. And I'm telling you, there's nothing more satisfying in life than smashing a birdie in somebody's face and winning the point. It is, <laughs> it is incredible. So I did finally figure out how to love competing at the same time that I, you know, we all were all friends and we all really enjoyed it. And my writing actually took off around that same time. So maybe there's something there too. Who knows? Oh. Nancy, Nancy, I was wondering that how is there, does that, is that story keep going or was that like, is that like a, gonna be a novel or is, um, because that was like such a cliffhanger of a moment. It's, it's, <laughs> it's uh, one of a series of linked stories mm -hmm. and there will be another story about about Kathy and what happens to her and her friends. <laughs> well, and I noticed that Nat Bailey was a side character in there and Nancy has written two novels about Nat Bailey. She's finishing both of them. It's a, and that's a mystery series, right? Nancy, is it okay for me to say that about now sure. that I've said it? <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Yes. Not published, but hopefully to be. <laughs> so it's in that same world. I just love it when yes. people, uh, you know, continue to build out a world like that. Um, yes. Yeah. And I used her because I wanted to show that during the pandemic and in life in general, 
that people who have other jobs sometimes are forced to take part-time jobs to, you know, make themselves, you know, have enough money to live. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Josh, you've been so quiet. I feel, yeah, I feel it. I unfortunately have to wind this down, but I do want to hit um, some of the Facebook comments real quick before we wrap up tonight. Um, Nancy, a couple of our viewers were a little bit late, but they're very excited to go back and hear your full story. Oh. Um, and then we've got some compliments on Gibson, your piece on winning in particular, as we, or sorry, Jefferson, your piece on winning. I um, mean, Gibson, the, the hockey poems. Um, we've got uh, Ann Elliott's in the comments, Courtney's in the comments. Um, we're just enjoying some of that. Um, but in particular, um, Courtney mentioned for the hockey poems, expecting poems about hockey, and then how it was so much more personal and probing. Um, and I saw that comment, I was really thinking about all three of these pieces today took very kind of intimate, personal moments and explored so much more with them, with the pandemic, with sports, with all these different individual things. Um, because I mean, even for me as someone who is not really a sports fan, listening to the reading tonight um, and just the, all, all that gets encompassed by such a immediate thing. And then the, Gibson, like you were saying in your intro, the, the family and relationships and childhood and all this other stuff. Um, and I think all three of you did that. And I, that's one of the things I love about hearing different writers is the things, the starting points and then what they explore from there and just understanding humanity in so many different ways. Um, and we get the same thing from these themes that we share. Um, we start from a pretty small point and then people take it all over the place. So it's always very fun to see what that looks like. Um, and our audience obviously is responding very well to that as well. Um, I just want to point out a little yeah. Easter egg too in today's performance. Um, Nancy mentioned crocus coming through snow as Gibson did in his poem. So I felt like it sort of came full circle. It was a nice little Easter egg for today. Yes. Those of you who um, came late, go back and listen. You'll catch it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for anyone who did tune in late or who has missed any of our events um, this season or last year, um, all of these are up on our Facebook and our YouTube channel. So go back, watch our fantastic um, readers share their work, share it with anybody else who you think might be interested. Um, yeah, any final thoughts before I wrap us up for the season? Just a big thank you to everyone who read for us, everyone who attended the readings, left comments on Facebook. This, the main writing is just so vibrant and wonderful and we just appreciate every bit of it and can't wait to see people in person next season. Yes. Um, yeah, so Gibson, Jefferson, Nancy, thank you for helping us close out the season this time. Um, also to Courtney and Julia last night, um, who are also part of this event. Um, and yeah, everyone who read for us, tuned in, chatted on Facebook, who has encouraged um, any of these writers. Writing can be very solitary sometimes and friends, family, community all means so much for us and for everyone who engages with it. So um, it's been a really good season. We are looking forward to next time, um, virtual or in person, we will see what things look like, but we're definitely all very excited to get back face to face again um, and see what that looks like. In the meantime, Local Writers Read will still be active on our website, on social media. Um, we're playing with some other possibilities for the off season. Um, so stay tuned, stay engaged, and um, everyone just stay safe. And we will see you again when the time comes. But thank you for listening.